So shortly I'm going to invite Rob Clyde up to the stage. Rob is our global chair of ISACA International. We are incredibly fortunate to have Rob here in the room today. He's been to a few BC Aware events in the past. There's over 200, 221 chapters, as I mentioned, with ISACA globally, so it's a real treat to be able to have his uh, time and attention and effort that uh, he puts into the BC Aware campaign. Rob's been a member of ISACA for 30 years and former CTO of Symantec. One of the things Rob's going to talk about today is the capability uh, maturity model institute, which is now part of the ISACA family. This, for myself, is one of the most interesting things about ISACA, further to the topic that we talked about last night in achieving measurable and tangible risk reduction. What are you measuring that against? What is tangible and who cares? This is a model that can be leveraged and uh, I'm super excited about that. So Rob, you can come to the stage, please. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I guess you kind of heard that I've been around for a while. Uh, I am actually older than Isaka, which may not be true for everybody in this room. Uh, and so I'm in my, actually in the middle of my third decade of doing cybersecurity. We didn't call it cybersecurity back then. And it was interesting in last night's panel, how many of you were at the panel last night? We have a few that were here. Uh, one, of the, one of the closing questions was asking, what's their biggest concern? And several said, insiders. Now, interesting enough, when I started my career in this space, it was before the internet. The only thing we really worried about were insiders and the occasional dial-up threat. If you didn't have any modems connected to your systems, you didn't really care much about the external threat. It was primarily insiders. So as much as things change, as much as they stay the same, as, as we heard last night. Now having said that, we have an awful lot of new technology, and I am a technologist at heart. So I have been coming to BC Aware for a, a number of years, and as you saw, we have 221 chapters. There's only one of me, <laughs> so as chair, there is no way I could visit everywhere. So I thought I'd just say, why do I come to BC Aware? What's, it, what's important about BC Aware? Well, I have to admit, one of the first things is it is in Vancouver. <laughs> I love oysters, and this is where the best oysters in the world are. That is a reason. Uh, probably a bigger reason is that a number of years ago, I, I did a presentation uh, for Isaka on leadership, and Justin just happened to be there. And he remembered exactly one thing, that early in my career when I had invented an intrusion detection system and we had a number of customers running it, I'm, uh, we, we were invited to actually install it for a proof of concept at the NFL, the National Football League. It is Super Bowl week. I did grow up in New England, go Patriots. <laughs> uh, I was excited to go to the headquarters of the NFL in New York City and install my product. The problem they were having is they, they had a network where all the teams were networked with syst each team had a system. And uh, this is before the internet. They were all networked and they were sneaking into each other's systems to try to steal things to get an advantage in games. Yes, cheating is not new. Uh, so my job was to help track down who those insiders were who were doing that kind of stuff, what staff members at the headquarters of the NFL were doing this. So I installed my product, not just on one, but on every team systems, including, including the headquarters system. It was working great. They were, they were getting alerts. They were seeing things. They were thrilled. Went to lunch, came back, and within 10 minutes, this, the main system at headquarters crashed. And within minutes, every single system on every team of the NFL crashed. And my contact said, hmm, you think this could be you? I don't think it could be. There's no way it could be your stuff, right? I said, you know what, I better check. 
And uh, so I checked, I looked at the system dump, and there were, t I always, in code, anybody who's coded, you leave telltale signs so it's easy to tell in, your dump, in the dump what it is. And sure enough, there were the telltale signs that indicated it was my software. And my contact was, I'm pretty sure it's not you. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, and I looked at him, and I made that hard decision and was honest and said, yep, it, I'm sorry to say it's our software. Pretty sure we can fix it. And he said, no, you know what? No need for that. You need to leave the building. And, and uh, so they escorted me to the door. And they said, please never come back. <laughs> And I've never been back. <laughs> so Justin remembered that, so that's the reason I'm here. But more importantly, this is a fabulous and important event that we have here at, uh, at BC Aware. I come because really, th this, is, this is a classic way in which our organization, ISACA, can partner with governments and so many other ways to do something bigger than just ISACA. And if you think about it, that's what we really believe in ISACA is that we're a force uh, enabler. So I'm gonna talk about a few things that, that Kimberly really asked me to address. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the research we've done at ISACA, some of the things we think about in terms of current security threats and trends. We're gonna talk about digital transformation and some of the research we've done in that area. And then as she indicated, I will, after all, last night we did talk about how do you measure security and how good you're doing. Isn't that like one of the existential questions of being in this profession? And having served on a number of boards, it is the question boards ask as well. How do we know we're doing the right thing? We're spending a lot of money. Are we spending in the right place? Are we doing the right thing? These are, these are key items. One of the way, ways we're trying to help is with a cyber maturity platform, leveraging our, our uh, CMMI acquisition that we did three years ago. So let's talk about the state of cybersecurity. We do a study every year. We have a new one. We always announce it at RSA. So if you're interested in the new one that'll be coming out, it'll be at RSA, and we do it in two parts. The first part is workforce challenges. And Kimberly already referred to this. No surprise, we have shortages. Three in five organizations have and are unable to fill cybersecurity positions. I will tell you, in this market we live in today, if you are a cybersecurity professional, this is harsh, but it's the truth, and you are unable to get a job, it's not the market, it's you. <laughs> you probably need to change careers. If you've been unemployed for a long time and you're a cybersecurity professional, take a hard look at yourself. That's not always true. We've had times in this market, uh, like others, when that isn't true, but that is the state we're at today. Interestingly enough, high, uh, employers also say that the applicants, 40%, do not have the necessary understanding of business needs. May I suggest to employers, if we have a shortage in the market, hire them and train them. We're not gonna always be able to get the perfect match. If it looks like they can actually fit within our organization and they're young, and a lot of times that's the reason they don't have business knowledge. I will tell you, when I was a young man and I was writing some of that code and was kind of more technical, I didn't have a good understanding of business needs either. Like most young people, I thought I knew everything. And that probably, uh, I had my, uh, mentors and board directors tell me how little I knew. And I would listen and they endured them. And then, over time, the words they were telling me started to sink in as, as I really started to understand business principles. Rarely do you just get there overnight. So just kind of keep that in mind. The other one is more troubling. 33% say they lack the technical skills. May I suggest that's what you have to learn in your technical training in school and so on, is really gain that technical knowledge. But also, if they've got the core and it's clear they have a technical aptitude, hire them and train them in the specific areas. 
because we do have specific areas we need them in. So may I suggest, if those are the reasons you're not able to fill a position, think out of the box using training and tools as a way to get there. And also consider cross-training, bringing people in from other careers, say a network, uh, networking professional, and train them in security. It actually isn't that hard. There are harder profession, physics. <laughs> for example, is a heck of a lot harder than learning computer security. I did high performance computing for a while. Trust me, that's way harder than computer security. We like to pretend it's really, really hard. Actually being successful and never being broken into is hard, probably impossible because of the human element. But understanding the core principles of security and understanding how to learn about different technologies we can do that, and lots of people can do that. So let's open that as, as we move forward. And notice how many say their gap is really on the technical side. Training is, 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 is going to be key if people have the aptitude. And secondly, as Kimberly mentioned, this is part of the answer. A, you know what the IT profession has in terms of a women population, female population? We are just about at that percentage right here, just looking out, 11%. Do you know what it was 10 years ago? 11%. Wow, we're making progress, aren't we? That's a reason why we formed She Leads Tech. In our specific profession of cybersecurity, I2 assurance, and uh, governance and risk, we do a little bit better, but we can do a lot better. And so uh, ISACA funds She Leads Tech in order to raise awareness prepare to lead, and build global alliances. We're not going to do this alone. We will partner with many other organizations that have similar ideals. So we specifically called it She Leads Tech, not because we think every woman has to become a CEO. We don't think every man has to become a CEO or anyone else. But why not prepare people to lead? Because in any organization, think about your own. There's the titles. There's the org chart, and there's reality of who do you really go to to get stuff done. And many times, that map is very different than what's shown in the org chart. And leadership is more reflected in that map. And, and organizations are realizing this, and there's a lot of, lot of reality in how team structures and so on are done. I'm confident that if we can do better and, and it can start at younger ages, it can start at older ages, and, and figure out ways together to really take advantage of a group of people that make up more than half of the world's population and have more of them involved in our, in our industry. This, this is just core. And I'm thrilled that we have this on the program today. Thank, thank you, Kimberly. So the second part of our survey is, okay, what's going on with cybersecurity and the threats? So half experienced an increase in attacks. And 80% say they expect to see an increase again this year. They said 80% was also the number last year and the number before. And the number, as long as I can remember, has been 80, around 80%. Everybody kind of expects it to get worse. Nobody expects it to get better. We do have a number of different threat actors. Uh, no big surprise, cyber criminals, in other words, people doing attacks for money, still seem to be at the top. Uh, then you have hackers. And notice, though, that we have a few other items. You've got insiders. And by the way, a lot of times the way to do cyber crime is to use an insider, so there's definitely some overlap. There's an overlap there. We've had the rise of nation states. And it used to be very small. It's now a significant effect. Most governments have both an offensive and defensive cyber capability. Many governments do not overtly use their offensive side. Some do. And so we see that, that trend that's happening out there. In the end, it's a lot of the same techniques. It really hasn't changed much. Malicious code, how long has that been going on? We have seen differences with things like ransomware. And last year at larger companies, we saw a drop in ransomware because frankly, you're better protected. 
you've done a better job at being ready for ransomware and keeping it from happening. Oftentimes, this starts to come into systems through phishing attacks. I will tell you that ransomware is still exploding because their primary target are small businesses, very small businesses, the small law firm, the police department with 20 people, where they don't have the necessary resources to be properly prepared and will often just pay the ransom. We also saw the emergence of uh, crypto jacking, breaking into systems so you can steal them in order to mine cryptocurrency. That's declined because cryptocurrency isn't worth quite as much. But we're going to continue to see these two types of attacks for cybercrime. Why? Because unlike others where you break into the system, you steal your data, then the, the criminal has to sell the data. Two-step process in order to get paid. With either ransomware or crypto jacking, you extract money directly from the victim. One-step process. To put it in business terms, it's a superior way to monetize computer crime. And that's why we see a rise in that. I predict we'll continue to see a rise in any type of computer crime that is simpler and that allows the attackers to extract value or money directly from the victim. Think of that as we move forward. We'll see more. Who would have guessed crypto jacking five years ago? There's a lot of innovation on the crime side. There will be something new. I'm not quite sure what it'll be, and I certainly don't want to give any ideas <laughs> on something like this either, because if I do, someone will do it. Uh, so we'll see more. And, and, and all of them, though, tend to be similar. By the way, a lot of us say phishing. The idea is train everybody to recognize a phishing attack. I got news for you. The way the phishing attacks are going, it will be almost impossible for human beings to detect. And we'll talk more about that. People are going to fall victim to phishing attacks. We need technology to assist us. We're not going to be able to do it just by training. Uh, so just, just keep that in mind. Training's a good idea, but it's hardly sufficient. So here's some of our biggest emer uh, cyber threats and emerging threats. These are from a couple of different sources, and there's a few I want to get into. I already talked about crypto jacking. Software subversion is not new, uh, but it's just exploiting vulnerabilities. It's been around forever. Uh, unpatched systems. Uh, sometimes figuring out, though, why not put the malware directly into the open source code that so many software vendors are using in their own products. Now you can just get it right from the beginning. It's built right in through the whole DevSecOps. It goes right through, and there's, this, there's the malicious code that's right in there, unless you have appropriate things happening during the process. We do know how to detect a lot of malicious code. There are tools that'll do a good job of doing that. They need to be run during that DevSecOps process or a CICD pi pipeline. And you should ask that question. Do we have a way in which we're automatically checking for malicious code inside of any open source software that we're using? If the answer is no, and it should be automatic, by the way, not a manual check, although code reviews are always a good idea and you probably should do one, you'll often miss it. Uh, we talked a little, you know, the cryptocurrency ecosystems might be attacked. I did want to just mention there's some of this, the security magazine kind of uh, mashed both threats and opportunities together. So this threat emulation attack is actually a good thing. There's the MITRE attack network where you can actually play with and try emulating different threats. It's actually a really useful uh, uh, tool that you might, you might look at. On the other side, on the MIT side, there were a couple of interesting things. Notice AI showing up twice. We can now, using AI, you can produce a fake video of someone saying anything you'd like them to say. That's a little scary. Video is no longer the evidence we once thought it was. And there are startups and companies rapidly emerging, trying to figure out how to detect automatically fake videos because of that need. Who would thought we would live in that age? Audio has been done for a long time. Uh, and AI is doing it. It's actually easy. It's so easy that it's no longer some expert. We could go out of here today, 
Each of us could probably spend two or three days learning how to use these tools and we could do it. It's not that hard. And that's a little bit scary. Blockchain is fabulous, and there's all kinds of new capabilities we can do with blockchain, but hidden, or I should say part of it, in many of them is this idea of code. That's all smart contracts is, is code, more code, that is inside the blockchain that gets executed. What if that code has a vulnerability in it? And yes, some have. And millions of dollars of certain cryptocurrencies have been stolen as a result. So the blockchain, if it has smart contracts, maybe no better than the code that's in it. And that's a little scary if we're using it for money. So just kind of keep that in mind. Some, some cryptocurrencies have been better than others. We use smart contracts for other types of things in order to allow us to have the, val uh, the uh, benefits of blockchain, but still could be some issues. I do want to just briefly mention this, this, this third one. And I, I'm not going to talk about attacking from the cloud because that's nothing new whether a system is broken into in the cloud or in your, on your on-premise and then pointed at you, it really doesn't matter where, where it's located. Whether it's a virtual machine, a container, you know, inside of AWS or on-premise, it's, it's still an issue. But this one about breaking encryption using quantum computers is huge. If somebody were to say, what is the single event that could cause the internet to suddenly not be trusted, it is this. Underneath the covers, the reason we can do transactions, the reason we can use the internet somewhat securely is because of mathematical algorithms, primarily based on the complexity of breaking, and I won't go into all the mathematical algorithms, but the, the, one, the best known one is RSA that is fundamental behind uh, the internet is you take two very large prime numbers, multiply them together, and that's your key, a very large semi-prime. Semi, because semi made up of two prime numbers. Turns out, mathematically, to try to use today's computers to factor that prime number back to the two original primes would take thousands of years if the key length is proper. Enter quantum computing in something called Shor's algorithm, which is a quantum factoring algorithm invented over 20 years ago. And you can actually break the prime numbers in seconds. Shor's algorithm has already been proven. It's already been run on smaller quantum computers. It works. Just one problem. Quantum computers aren't big enough. They don't actually have enough what they call qubits, or the quantum bits, which are not zeros and ones, by the way. Uh, and once we get enough of those, it's not a question of if, it's when. Encryption as we know it today on the internet will be broken. And all of a sudden, overnight, we can't trust anything. Or even worse, governments may have the capability and not tell us. And now they're watching everything and maybe injecting some things. That's an even scarier situation. So fortunately, it's not Armageddon. I will predict, even though MIT put it as a concern for 2019, I doubt we'll achieve that, that type of quantum capability in 2019. It's probably still years off, fortunately. And we have an effort by NIST. So this is a true problem. That's why NIST is actually trying to come up with new algorithms, and they have a number of submissions, about 60, to use as the new standard that will not be able to be broken by quantum computing. In other words, they're quantum resistant or post-quantum algorithms, and we'll solve that. How many of you were thinking of that problem before you came here? Some a bit, good. You should be, you should be. Not because you're going to do anything about it, just keep an eye on it. Because if something happens and somebody says, we have a 300 qubit quantum computer, we're changing the world, and it comes out of China, or by the way, they're working on it, or it comes out of Intel or somebody, and they're all working on it. Google has one, IBM's working on one. They all have them, they're just not big enough. If you suddenly hear those kind of numbers, worry. If you haven't also heard we have a new algorithm or here's how we're going to push it out, you're going to push it out everywhere. 
everywhere, every browser, everywhere. This won't be easy, but we can do it. So let's talk a little bit about digital transformation. This is, these are some things, according to the World Economic Forum, that are changing the world. And we kind of talked a little bit about each of these. Uh, wearable Internet's important as we look at more things, like the Internet of Things, that's, that's kind of key. As we look at artificial intelligence, that will be key. These are all opportunities for growth transformation. And as we look at things like uh, how we, we do customer engagement better, that's really part of how we transform digitally. Create new customer value. And the, and the uh, interesting thing is, those who are ahead of the curve in digital transformation are actually less risk averse when it comes to considering, testing, and adopting emerging technologies. <coughs> Think about your own organization. Is the first thing when you hear about something like AI, wow, that's got a lot of issues, got a lot of problems, not mature yet, we'll just wait and see. And wait, and wait. Versus an organization that says, wow, we better learn about this. We'll test it in our labs, we'll learn about it, we'll understand the risks, and we'll figure out how we can adopt it. Obviously, the second one is going to be more likely to adopt it earlier, and they get ahead of the others. And our studies show that that is true. Good news is, nine out of ten organizations that we interviewed indicated that they were on a digital transformation journey. Just about all of us are doing this. And, and digital transformation is different than digitation, which we've done forever. Digitation is really just make the way we're currently doing things and, and do it online for operational efficiency and scale. It's been going on since the 90s. We're well down that path, and it's important, and we need to continue it. Digital actually means that we're gonna find new ways to increase customer value. And that means finding new business models and using the digital world and new technologies as a way to change that. I'm gonna talk about two. The Internet of Things and AI. And by the way, I should in indicate 42% said they were transformed. I think the number will actually go down. We have so many new technologies, I'm not sure that number is gonna go up next year. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see which, which way it goes. Because are we actually keeping pace or kind of falling a little bit behind? I, I think it's the latter. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about uh, each of these. We'll start with AI. So AI has really come on. When we ask which emerging technology has the greatest potential to help you in your digital transformation, you no know, big surprise, big data and analytics have been the leader. And there's good reasons for that. But notice the drop of big data between 2017 and 2018 and the emergence of AI. That's a huge change in the gap of what people think is the most important. And then you marry that with the question of, are you confident you can actually accurately assess the security of AI-based systems or machine learning systems? And the answer was no by 60%. Good question, so let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Now you might ask, why in the world am I putting up a slide about gene editing? Well, gene editing has actually become digital. There's a tool called CRISPR-9, Cas9, that you can use to edit genes. It's been used now for a while, particularly in the US and in Canada for editing things like plants and, uh, and making it so that we can actually have better crops. This is, this is not new and doing it automatically a little bit with some animals, a lot in the lab. Well, China has adopted the tool completely and has already begun trials on human beings to cure cancer. Pretty exciting. Editing people's genes to make it so they no longer have cancer. We can detect, for example, which genes are make, make it more likely that you have breast cancer. What if we end, if you happen to have those genes, why not? Remove them or disrupt them, and now you won't get cancer. Or if you do have it, maybe you'll get better. Who knows? It's not clear if you will, but maybe you will. Well, we've gone even further. Uh, a little while ago in China, we actually had somebody use this tool to modify 
two embryos genetically so that they no longer had, they disrupted the gene for HIV. Actually, they did it for one of the children. The scientist used the other child or embryo as a control and didn't turn it off so that you could actually see the difference between the two. And then the babies were implanted in a woman's womb and delivered and are alive today. And will probably grow up. Why is this significant? Unlike the other stuff, when you change the genes inside of an embryo, they will be passed on to future generations. We've already hit the point where human beings have changed, rather than evolution, have changed the genetic makeup of our race. That's scary. And as you can imagine, most scientists said, whoa, even in China, most scientists have said, whoa, that is uh, going too far. We weren't ready for this. What the heck is going on? We'll probably see more things like this. Why do I mention this? Well, underneath the covers, CRISPR-9 looks a lot like programming. And you even saw somebody sitting at a computer in order to, to program this. You can disrupt genes. You can delete genes. You can correct or, or insert them. And you use a program to do this, which then helps deliver the actual method to make this happen. Well, that's kind of interesting. Genes aren't like programs, though. Those aren't ones and zeros. Genes often have multiple purposes, and we never really know quite what the effect is when we disrupt, delete, insert, or correct a gene. So it's really complicated. So complicated, we probably need an artificial intelligence to help us do it. And that's happening, both to analyze the genomes and to correct them. We will hit the day, and, I, and this will be a good thing. Almost all of us, I would guess all of us, have been impacted by someone we know and love who has cancer or had cancer and maybe passed away. Every human being has probably been touched by that in some fashion. <coughs> Imagine the day when if you're diagnosed with cancer, your doctor tells you, and I have the treatment just for you, and it will work. Not a probability, it will work. Come in, we'll modify your, the necessary genes, and you'll be good to go. That day will probably come. Or designer drugs that come from this kind of thing. But it's also a little scary. AIs in charge of editing humans' genes? AIs are self-learning. Machine learning. Are we hitting the age where AIs can program us? Let's talk a little bit about that. When I was young, uh, in school, I actually studied artificial intelligence. Very carefully, my teacher told us that the holy grail for artificial intelligence was to be able to beat a grandmaster of the ancient game of Go. Not chess, Go. Why? Because there are more moves, possible moves in Go, than chess, than there are atoms in the universe. We actually have the computing power today to brute force chess so that we computers can win every time. We're nowhere near that for Go, and we probably never will be. And so that means that for a uh, uh, artificial intelligence to actually beat a human being, it really has to be smart. It has to kind of do things as we would almost say intuitively, like a human being does. It can't just use algorithms in order to do that. And we went years and years, and for years AI professionals would say, we're still a decade off, we're still a decade off. And then all of a sudden, Google with AlphaGo beat a grandmaster, and, and the world woke up. Wow, AI has arrived. We just reached the holy grail. And it's gone even further. So that was a good one. It, was, it did machine learning. It was fed games played by grandmasters. Millions and millions and it learned and beat a grandmaster. So Google said, hey, why don't we do a version of AlphaGo that's different? Why don't we just teach it the basic rules of the game and then have two systems and let AlphaGo Zero play itself and learn from itself and figure out how to win by trying to beat itself, and so they did. And with three days, AlphaGo Zero beat the version of AlphaGo that had beat the Grandmaster, just three days. No 
training by human beings. All self-learning from itself. Within 21 days, it reached the level of AlphaGo Master. It defeated 60 professionals online and the world champion. And today is arguably the world champion of the world. And it did it using techniques that no human being had ever figured out in thousands of years of playing Go. Turned the world of Go on its head. Now imagine that kind of an AI, self-learning, in charge of GDAR. What might it come up with? In charge of other things like traffic systems, what might it come up with? Might it learn that the best way in a traffic system to improve traffic, which is its goal, is to actually reduce the number of cars on the road, and the best way to do that is major accidents. Lots of them. In its simple way of self-learning, that's a, that's a way a human being would have never came up, a new way of playing the go game of traffic, but one we would not be very happy with. This is why it makes AI a little bit scary. It's also being used to break into systems. Remember I said earlier, it's doubtful we'll be able to stop phishing attacks of today because we'll use AI to build uh, phishing attacks that really, really hit that and, and make that uh, effort hard to do. It also means, though, we probably need AI to actually check the security of our systems and the future of cyber defense is also AI. A lot of ethical concerns. We need to get our heads wrapped around this. Governments need to be involved. Professionals need to be involved. We need partnerships in order to do this. Similarly, with the world of IoT, we have similar types of issues that we need to, we need to look at. So we've seen things, for example, where hackers used the Internet of Things and the vulnerabilities in them to create a massive network of a half a million devices attacking the uh, DNS servers and brought down the parts of the internet briefly. Not computers that were broken into, but cameras and other types of IoT devices. And D-Link actually got hit by the FTC for its vulnerabilities in its cameras. We see cars that are at risk, and this kind of goes on and on as we look at this situation. Well, we also see, well, if we got this Internet of Things out there and it has the chance to look at us, listen to us, video us, maybe we'll use it to spy on you, said the former U.S. Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper. Maybe. Well, maybe China is actually already doing this and using its tech, tech giants to actually make that happen and using facial identification you can actually pay with facial identification, but now you can track that and track people wherever they go by knowing their face. I know of companies that know how to track you by your heartbeat and can tell from 100 or 200 uh, feet away whether or not it's you are in that room. Don't even have to see you just by your heartbeat. Interesting things that we are that we are heading towards as we look at the future. So let me just briefly talk a little bit about the cyber maturity platform as we wrap up here. So we really built this because of the issue that was brought up last night of how can we measure security? How can we do it with confidence? How can we do it in a way that we can explain security and where we're at to non-security people? Has it always been a challenge? And answer questions like, is their level of investment right? Are we addressing the right issues? And very importantly, what are our competitors? What's our industry doing? And are we at least equal, if not above them? Really a core question for a director. And in addition, can we go beyond just being compliance-based? It's not a bad place to start. Compliance is a good thing. But can we figure out how to take our capabilities and actually get to a resilience-driven Organization. It's a big topic for boards. How do we achieve cyber resilience? Believe it or not, boards talk about this. They've gone beyond cybersecurity and they focus on cyber resilience, an even bigger problem. And we should think about that. That, that encompasses more things. As a, anybody who is a risk or governance professional, this should probably speak to you. 
And there might be different aspects of this. Not all companies are the same, and, and CMMI has always recognized that. So the idea is to have some standards around maturity at the lower levels in certain areas, and companies can decide what level they want to be at. Then be able to roll it up and have it organization-wide, have it be risk-based, have a roadmap. So in other words, you can have a desired state, and you can see where you're at today and figure out where those gaps are. Gap analysis is crucial in any effort, and we rarely do this in our industry, and we should. And we can then look at compliance views. And, and this maps to, very importantly, the frameworks we're likely to use, from NIST to COVID-5, to ISO, to CSF, to you know, even CMMI itself, the historical CMMI, the threat kill chain, et cetera. So there are mappings that are already in place. If anybody's familiar with CMMI, these should look very familiar to you. Levels one through five, I won't go through these, these will be in your handouts, but they're the same kind of levels just now move towards security. And it's great to have an organization that is not a vendor, that was the beauty of CMMI all along, unbiased, just here's, here's what it is, guys, and to try to create a standard as it did with CMMI around this. It's been asked for, frankly, it took too long. People asked CMMI to do this for two decades, and they were resistant. So I saw at the bottom, <laughs> and now they're not resistant. Uh, and in fact, they were very excited to, to work on this over the last few years. So we can do things like this. This is, these are various, you don't need to read all of these, but these are various capability areas that go into what makes maturity. This is crucial. Should we measure security by how many times we got broken into? No. If you're a major target, you're gonna get broken into. Sorry, it's gonna happen. Maybe you weren't as major as the company next to you and you didn't get broken into as much, but your security was worse. We need other things than that for measuring it. And, and the capabilities is probably the right approach. It has been for many other types of things, such as software development. And then you can measure that across. The light blue is where you'd like to be. So notice you're not always at a five. The dark blue is where you're at or the black, I should say, where you're at. This company has some work to do. We can even drill down into the specific practices that go into a capability area and see how we're doing there. And you can even compare it over time. Board directors like to know are we getting better or worse. You should too, really important. And by the way, you can dole those out because you might have individuals in charge of the different capability areas or practice areas. And even within one of those, you can see what level you're at. And you can do that by whether or not you meet certain criteria. I want to emphasize, the goal of CMMI is not to get everybody to level five across the board. Very few organizations will be in a situation where that just makes sense from a risk management perspective. It will cost too much. But it's hard to decide what the right thing is across the board because frankly, it'll depend on different organizations, which ones you want to push the needle harder on and which ones you don't. And that's the nature of this to allow that. Over 7,000 individual areas go into this and there are different area, ways in which you would address these. Important for me, uh, you can see this red, that shows the industry average and the green shows where we're at in this particular company. A little better look, by the way. We're actually doing better in this company against what everybody else is doing versus what we want to do. So finally, if you think about this, it is all about pace. This is a data-driven future. The pace of technology and advancements, remember what I showed you about AI and gene editing and what's happening with quantum and with the way AIs are developing far more rapidly than any of us could have imagined. We've got to figure out how do we build in privacy and security by design so that it is automated, not manually checked. We'll run out of time to manually check it. You can't even manually check an AI. I'm sorry, it's impossible. But the only way to check an AI is likely to be with another AI. So we've got to figure out these kinds of things as, as, as we move forward. Just keeping pace, and I would argue we've actually fall, tend to fall behind, not even keep pace, isn't going to be enough. 
So it's not about what we'll do tomorrow. It's about what we need to start doing now. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. We're going to do a little bit of a change. It'll take a second. So I will take one question while we're making the switch here. Any, any questions? Yes. Thank you. By the way, I would suggest to each person in this room, you do not need to learn every single one of these this year. But I would suggest you at least get to know the overview and pick one that really interests you and do a deep dive. And do that every year. Make that a habit to do a deep dive every single year. Good, good question. <clears throat>